good. All right. Don't know where we're going to go. I think. I said about continuation of this is one never, life is one never ending service. Yeah. Honest, like this first service, I don't, I don't know where to end. I don't, time doesn't work out for me because there's no time clock in heaven. And Jesus said, the less pain can come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Since there's none there, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, honestly, I believe, I believe that life is one big service. But like my life, it's crazy. I, I, you know, I, I go to churches, I go to places, I do home groups, I do churches, I do whatever. I mean, I don't, I, it's constant, poor now. But like when I'm on a flight, when I'm on an airplane, like today, I'll be on an airplane for a long time. <laughs> I will. I think I have 28 hours of flight. <laughs> 28 hours. What are you going to do? I'm going to fellowship with Jesus. I'm going to have a whole spirit land on lots of people on my flight. I just got fucked up to an upgrade across America, so lots of people in a different class are going to be. Uh, <laughs> don't. I get, when I get bumped up the first class, that's awesome. Like, I, I mean, it's also awesome just a different breed of people that I came to talk to back there. But when I come up here, they're like, oh my gosh, he's up here with us. <laughs> I'm serious, it's awesome. It's really good. Like, my mind, I just think different. I think, I think with heaven's perspective. I don't think... Ministry. I, I just don't think that. I don't like my never ending service isn't ministry. My never ending service is that I gave my life to God and I can take me back. Like you don't have the right to live as a mere man anymore now that you've given your life to God. If you have a ministry, that's great, but life is a ministry. <clears throat> like your workplace, your your if you're at church and you're preaching in a pulpit, that's awesome. But who are you at work claiming to know Jesus? Do you live that? Do you just confess that, or do you be quiet, have a basket on your head, and not confess it? Come on, man, at least file. Look, <laughs> it's not okay to be the only one in your workplace that knows you're a Christian. I don't care how hard you think your job is, how hard you think the people around you, you don't know where I work, you don't know people know, you don't know Jesus. Come on, I'm not being mean, I'm being real. You know him, and you can't help but just live him. Why? Because you know him. Come on, Paul was like, I know everything, and I count it all in two for the sake of knowing him. That's awesome. Paul was really smart, he knew everything. He was brilliant, he was a top scholar from the Paul from the Bible, right? He knew everything, he was trained under one of the best, Camellia, which was the best of the best. Paul was the elite. And he said, you know what, all that? All that I might know. It's awesome. Everywhere we go, we know him more. And everywhere we're around, every person we're around, we know him more. We get to emulate Christ. We get to give people Jesus in us. I remember this one time I went, and I'll just share a, a couple of testimonies probably here and there. And it's for my heart out there. You guys okay with that? Yeah. All right. Well, he gave me the mic and said, just be free. <laughs> so I'll just tell you about one of my first class stories, okay? Just I mean, I fly a lot, so they sometimes they upgrade me, which is cool. And uh, I remember going on there, and I had these, I wear these funny, these five-finger shoes, right? So they draw the attention of the airline people. They're like, oh, awesome shoes! And I'm getting on, and, and like, I got my guitar on my back, so people think I'm a musician. I feel like, oh, Jesus, with my guitar, you know? And so I get on there, and the lady says, oh, nice shoes. And there's a guy in front of me, he turns around, looks at my shoes. He's got the business suit on, you know, he's like all decked out and all dressed up, and he's going on business, and he's sitting in first class, and I go on, and she's like talking to me for a little bit, and I'm holding the line up, and she's asking questions, oh, no, that's awesome, and what do you do? And I said, well, I said, are you a musician? Well, kind of, I get to worship Jesus with everything I am, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> right? And, and. They go and they sit down, and this guy's like shaking his head and stuff. And lo and behold, he doesn't know it, but I'm going to sit beside him. <laughs> Serious, this is how it works. It's awesome. <laughs> so I just sit down beside him, I put my guitar up, and I'm like, hey man, how you doing? He's like, oh. You know, he's kind of like resisting. <laughs> but love doesn't get upset or freaked out or stressed out or, well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I was, he's going to wait till later. I'm going to give him Jesus. I'm going to love him. He's just going to get the gospel, man. So I get to sit down, and, and I'm like, man, 
and he's like, I'll take a gin and tonic, and I'll take another one, and I'll take another one, and he's like drinking it up. You know? <laughs> they get to drink for free, I guess, up there. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, yeah, she's coming by me. I'm just thanking her. She gives my water. No, I'm really good. Just, I feel, I want to just love them. The people. Sometimes they're mistreated. The airline attendants. It's just weird, man. It's just, we, we don't like hit us in the face and we treat people like we're like life hits us and then we we complain about our life and then we hit other people. So bizarre. Do you think that's wrong? That's twisted, right? Like. Life is hard, and then all of a sudden you complain about it, and then someone comes to you because we give them a piece of our mind. That's just not good, right? And then people don't want to come to church because they can't see Christ in us, so they don't want anything to do with who we are. I'm not saying you, I'm just saying in general. You guys all right? Yeah. You're getting pretty passionate here in a little bit. Yeah. You keep it calm for a little. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there beside this guy, and he's just like third one in. Third gen of and I said, Hey, you know, sometimes I get to hear in my heart about people. And he goes, What are you talking about? And I said, Well, what I'm hearing in my heart is if you're a real estate investor and you're going somewhere right now to work on an investment project where you're going to get government funding and to, to go into a housing project with some things that you're doing, and there's a favor on your life, man. It's going to be a good deal. He's like, Who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm actually just a Christian. I love Jesus with all my heart. You heard me, really? He said, y'all heard him. I said, well, I really am. I said, as a matter of fact, man, I used to play baseball. I'm young, right? Yeah. I said, you heard your right shoulder. He said, yeah. I said, man, no, let me pray for it since I told you about it. You didn't tell me. She's like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, I just, listen, life is a service. Everywhere in life, you've got the ability to touch someone you've got. But we've got to get this fixed so we stop seeing what's wrong and we can live with what's made right. right? Yeah. It's all about your life. It's all about, it's all about leaving a legacy. It's all about leaving a legacy of what one man or what one woman could do that was possessed by God that never allowed their life to be part of speed, whether the world was or wasn't. But they always lived held by love. It's the love of Christ who tells them. It's, it's the love of Christ. It's, it's right around that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 where we're like, where, where we start talking about like we're a new creation in Christ. It's right in the love of Christ we call it. It's in there. So I'm talking to this guy, and he's like, yeah, now I'm going to start. And I'm just, man, I'm just going, yeah, man, let me, let me share with you where I came from. And I told him, I said, man, you know what? In my life, if, if you were to meet me, I think this was like one year ago. If you didn't meet me six and a half years ago, you, you wouldn't have liked me. He's like, what? He said, you're a good guy, man. So you, so you don't understand what I've been through for my life. But what do you mean? It can't be that bad. And I start to share with you. know? And just so you guys have an understanding of, of where my life was. And some of you do. And, but I was a drug addict for like one year. You know, I was an atheist my whole life. I couldn't stand Christians. I never really saw one that really walked it out. I heard a lot of people that confessed one thing, but lived another. I saw a lot of that's actually that's actually in the Greek, it's called hypocrite. Hypocrite. But Jesus said, Woe do you hypocrites. Hypocrite means wearing a mask like on a stage. Like you claim to be one thing, but you're living a different thing. Right? He called the Pharisees hypocrites all the time because they claimed to know one thing and they lived another. He said, you clean the outside of the cup and you think that that's okay. He said, first clean the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean. Right? You're dressed up in these robes and these nice things, but inside you're full of nasty. He said, you're like, you're like tombs that people walk over. It's not good. He, he rebuked them. If you look at Matthew and look at the rebukes of Jesus, to them, whoa, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain a gnat, swallow a camel. I mean, he was really, really adamant against that thing. Jesus was adamant against self-exaltation and against self-righteousness and against people that thought that they had it, yet inside weren't okay. So it's very, very important that we wouldn't have claimed godliness without actually having an encounter with God. It, it would be very important that we don't claim something and live another. It's very important that we don't 
that we don't just come to church, but then change. Like, I think it's awesome that we're here on a Sunday, but who are you on Monday? It's really important because if it's just about playing church, we're in trouble. Because the devil is not threatened by us playing church. The devil is, is threatened by us knowing who we are. Right. The enemy can't come up into heaven, I said at the first service, and he's done God because he already tried that. It didn't work and God put him here. Then he created man in his image, God did, so that he could thump the devil every day and remind him about who he, who he lost. He tried to rise up above God. He put him here. He created man in his image so that we would understand who we are in Christ because of what Jesus paid the price for, so that we would realize that the highest part of hell is beneath the lowest part of us. But we have to think from a different perspective. We have to think and have our mind fixed on things above. We have to know that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places and we're supposed to live from heaven towards earth. We are not supposed to live from earth towards heaven or out. We will, we will live hopeless towards hope instead of Hopeful. Right. Be with me. Instead of towards the victory, we live from it. Instead of going through intercession and warring to break through the second, we have to change the way we think because we're seated in the third. I'm going to say that again. I want you to listen. A lot of intercession is done in warfare and warring trying to break through and have a breakthrough through the second so that we get an answer. Instead of living from a place of rest, pouring from the third, realizing that the second has already been broken. Sometimes we're in warfare, shadow boxing with the enemy because we don't believe the finished work. Right. I want, and you better hear this because you will be worn out in warfare. And the weapons of our warfare are not from but are mighty in God. Right? That's the second Corinthians. Are you with me? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Where are they? Out here? No. Taking every thought captive. So the strongholds are in here, man. Are you with me? You don't have to try to pull down a stronghold out here. You, you pull down a stronghold in here. Any thought that rises itself up against the knowledge of God. Guess what that thought is? Any thought that you could possibly have that's not renewed by the Spirit of God. The weapons of our warfare are not caught up in our mighty end God for pulling down strongholds, taking every thought captive to the obedience of the mind of Christ. Well, what thought could that possibly be? It says that the carnal man is at war against God. Is that enmity against God? That means that any thought that comes from the carnality of mind, from the human wisdom side, is at war against God Almighty. That's cut and dry. That's simple. That, no, there's no if, ands, or buts. There's no in between. He said, any thought that I've got that's not renewed by God, not renewed by the Spirit of God, not breathed on, not renewed, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You take every thought captive, but you start to think of the mind of Christ. And don't say, well, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and his ways are higher than my ways. And stop there. Finish to the end of the passage where it says, but we have been given the mind of Christ. Amen. So don't stop there and say, well, who can know his thoughts? Who can know his No, we are not to be unwise, but know the will of the Lord. God would not put that in there and say, well, you can't know my will and play charade. That would be crazy. That's not God. God said we can know His will. God said that we can redeem the time for the days of evil. Every second that God gave us is to be brought back to the original value of why He gave it to us. And He gave us time to reveal Him. Come on, mercy woke you up today. And grace said, hey, wake up. It's time to get up. Today I'm giving you one more day to manifest me and not you. It's the reason why you're alive. You're alive to bring Jesus. You're alive to, to live Jesus to... To bring him everywhere you go. You're not supposed to leave him at the house when you go shopping. <laughs> Come on, man. We've got to change the way we think. We can be naturally supernatural. You can be known as a man or a woman that walks possessed by God, that is not dominated or manipulated by circumstance, but is compelled by love, that lives from a perspective that nobody has ever seen. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be so heavenly minded that we're earthly incredible, where people around us are freaked out. When we walk in the room. 
I'm serious. Why? Because you know what? Faith is? Faith is powerful. But everybody that's outside of faith has to do everything they can to get you out of the room to feel good about yourself again. So unbelief has to do everything it can to get you out of the way because to feel comfortable about unbelief, belief has to be absent. I'm going to say that again. I want you to hear me. This is really important. Sometimes when we try to witness to our family, to our jobs, to our people, they are uncomfortable with us and they're aggravated by us because in order for unbelief to feel comfortable, I'm not talking about unbelief in Jesus. I'm talking about, okay, I have a grip for who God is. This is how big He is. This is God. God is this big. This is what I believe about God. And then you come along with, and you have a greater revelation of, of God in the supernatural realm. And then all of a sudden you start to walk this out. And they get very freaked out by you walking what you know God to be at. But you shouldn't have to confess, look at what kind of tree I am. You should just allow the fruit that's on your tree to bear witness of what kind of tree you are. Come on, when's the last time you went to an apple orchard and you saw an apple trees going, Apples! <laughs> Think about it. Did you ever see an apple tree freaking out to try to produce apples? Did you ever see a cherry tree going, Cherries! Come on! Ah, yes, I'm a cherry tree. God's well pleased that we bear much fruit. So Christians shouldn't talk it so much as they just produce fruit. Because a good tree bears good fruit. And then all of a sudden, the people that doubt it have to believe because of the fruit that's on the tree. And guess what's in the fruit? The seed. And yeah. every seed reproduces after its own kind. So what if you just wore that kind of fruit in your family and in your workplace and stuff, and all of a sudden, Amen. Come on, man, I used to work for this company, right, called the Good Time Ice. Did you ever see the trucks? Well, when I first started there, they were very, very freaked out by me praying for everybody I saw all the time. <laughs> I'm talking all the time, but all the time. And, and the guys that were on the routes and stuff, the Christians and, and people that worked were like, you know, this is not okay, this is not okay. Now, even the drivers that didn't believe that, that was true right now are being called to pray because of what happened when I worked I'm not, I'm not glorifying me. I'm talking about what a person can do on their job. You can leave a legacy. See, now, people at the different places that I visited are like, where's that guy that prays for everybody? And I haven't been there for how long? Uh, five years? Huh? It's been five, it's been five years, I guess, since like I, I haven't worked there. Five, no, four years. Yeah, four years. It's been four years since I haven't worked there. And still people are talking about the time when I did work there. So the guys that didn't believe in praying for the sick are now praying for the sick and the sick being you. I'm serious. You can leave that legacy. You can leave that everywhere you go. You leave that fruit that reproduces after its own kind. That's awesome. You've got the ability to do that. Do you know that when this happens in your life and the identity of who you really are changes, it won't be your J-O-B anymore. It'll be your L-O-B-E. Then you won't complain about going to work. That didn't bring any smiles at all. <laughs> that means there's a lot of complaining going on. Come on. <laughs> Your workplace is a place for you to leave a legacy. Of what one man, what one... It doesn't matter what you've been. Just repent. It doesn't matter how you've lived. Just repent. The days of your day. His mercies are new. All you do is go, you know what? I have it. Now I have it. God, thank God that now I see you. And then, and, and then when you find yourself stretching and, and want to, to, to live out loud, and you find yourself kind of getting squeezed a little, then you just say, Father, thank you. That's, that's just me trying to let hold back. God, I just thank you that you're amazing. And just work like And he'll just do it, man. Come on, man, when I delivered ice, I saw between 10 and 30 people healed every day on my job. Every day. Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and all those stores, the ice stores in Harrisburg, I used to deliver. Didn't matter what they believed. I'm the believer. <laughs> Come on, it doesn't matter what they believe. I'm the believer. You're the believer. You get the prophesied because you're a believer. Well, they don't believe. So what? 
What's that have to do with anything? I thought you were the believer. Why do you need them to be in agreement with you? You know, just speak life instead of death. Start to prophesy happiness and joy and, and edify and encourage. Jesus didn't give us the ministry of, of, of rebuking. He gave, I, I, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people back to a loving God. Not in the world trespasses against them. Come on, man, that's the ministry we got. Doesn't matter if you're preaching from a pulpit. He said that we've all been called. All of us have been called. Called, justified, glorified. That's the Bible. That's what he said. I'm going with that. All of us. It's you. Doesn't matter where you've been. Where you've been has nothing to do with who you are. Except for a testimony to glorify God and his goodness and what he's done. Amen. Are you okay? Yeah. So I pray for this guy's shoulder and he gets you. He's like, wow. He goes, this is really awesome. We get done the plane. It was only like an hour flight. We get done the flight and he's like, he's like, you know, he goes, I am so glad that I had this conversation with you today. He goes, this is amazing. He goes, my whole, everything's changed. He said, God is so amazing. He loves you so much. You're awesome. He's just like, but my, understand my plane ride didn't start out that way. Started out with mocking and making fun, angry, and then all of a sudden, whoop, everything changed. Why? Because I didn't let that affect me. Yeah. Hear this. We can't afford, now that the sin issue has been crushed in our life, because God calls us saints, not sinners. That's why it's important to see who God says we are. God's, God calls his son. See, the cross, I love Nick, and he shared that with his son. My revelation of the cross is that Jesus didn't come on the cross to reveal our sin. Amen. The cross came to reveal our value. Yeah. The cross wasn't just because I was such a horrible sinner. Jesus paid a price on the cross to reveal my value. Yeah. It said that he was crucified for my offenses, but he was raised for my justification. Yeah. That's awesome. Crucified, one punch to the devil. Bang! Hits the devil, seems like that. Yeah. And then he was raised. Boom! <laughs> Uppercuts, see you later, devil. <laughs> For my justification. Just as if I never missed it. Just as if I never hit the truth. God sees me as if I never missed the moment. That's crazy. What if you saw yourself that way? What if you woke up, looked in the mirror, and said, God, God, thank you. Thank you for who you call me to be. God, thank you for who you say I am. What if you woke up in the mirror and you looked in the mirror and you didn't see yourself or your faults, your failures, and the things you wish you never did, but you just believed the gospel? <laughs> Come on, I'm serious. What if you just looked in the mirror and you just believed what God said about you? What if you opened your Bible and you just said, yes! <laughs> Come on, your yes to God can be so big that every stranger's voice loses its voice. <laughs> your yes to God can be so intense. Whoa! Then when people try to hurt you, you're like, that didn't even hurt. That's awesome. <laughs> what would it be like to be an unoffended people group? Yeah. <laughs> Not just going, that didn't hurt. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> what would it be like to actually live from a place where people sin against us and never produced it in us? Point. This all comes from identity. This all comes. Man, if we can't handle it when people are bitter towards us, how are we going to handle it when a gun's in our face? Think with me, God. We're not getting out of the whole tribulation deal. <laughs> Jesus said we're supposed to be a good cheer when we go through it. <laughs> He's not just going to rapture us out and we're going to escape it all. Stuff happens, things happen, and it's getting darker. But it's the light that you carry in the front of you. darkness and deep darkness shall cover the earth. But not so with you. Now rise and shine. For your light has, let me say, will says has. That's confusing to me because the rise and shine of your light has come, as Isaiah prophesied, 700 years. 700 years. 700 to 800 years before Christ Jesus came. Arise and shine for your life it has come. That's crazy, right? Are you with me still? Have I lost you? You know, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so we get off the plane and he's just 
just like, man, thanks so much. You really helped me. So I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you so much. He goes, I, I believe that. But it didn't start that way. People are waiting for you to pull the gold out of it. People are waiting for you to encourage them, to edify them, to build them up. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the video of the guys that were in. Uh, anybody watch any of the videos I've done? There? Anybody see any of them? None of you? Yeah. Okay. There's one in Las Vegas. Did you see the Las Vegas? There's just Las Vegas one I did for the CPM. Let me explain to you. Let me set, the, let me set it for you. I went to Las Vegas, I went to CBN, we went out, it's 12.30 night, we went in front of this hotel that I'm sure none of you know, it's in Las Vegas, so none of you probably know what it is. It's called the Bellagio Hotel. <laughs> there's, these, there's these sprinklers, these water shovels in front. It's fascinating. It's like, plays the music and it's like the water show. That fascinates me. I'm like freak out by little stuff though. I, 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 I just dance. I'm like, oh my gosh, do you see that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just going, right? Love you, bro. See you, man. Love you, Jim. So this thing, and, and we're out there, we got the cameras, and we walk up, and there's these two kids that were on the corner, they're just playing guitar. And uh, we walked up, we had the cameras, and everything, big camera, the lights. Like, well, you guys think in a movie? We're like, yeah, dude, you want to be in it? <laughs> yeah, it's not really a movie, it's kind of like a show. It's like, oh, yeah, man, awesome, man. I said, well, can I, can I, can I play with you guys? They're like, you play? I'll sing with you. Oh, you want to sing? You say, yeah, man, we want to sing. We want to sing some stuff, we want to sing some this. And I said, no, I said, you know how to play any blues? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, come on, do it, man. Let's play some blues. And, 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 and. <laughs> I'm like, I got Jesus, and he's on my side. Well, I got Jesus. And I was like a rip, dude. And the kid was like, yeah, I love that. So the kid was like, oh, it's awesome, yeah. Oh. He's jamming, right? And I'm like, that was awesome, man. I'm like, dude, I'm like, I just want to talk to you guys for a second. We're like, oh, all right, what's up? And I said, man, I said, I just, when I came up here and I started talking to you, there's a depression thing that's on you guys. And it's like suicidal thinking <coughs> right now on you. And I said, it's not okay not to think like that. Jesus paid the price for you not to have to think like that. And I want to pray for you so that thinking stops right now. And he's like, oh, no, no, you're great, man. So I prayed over him. And if you watch the video, the presence of God comes, he goes, what is that? And they just started to freak out, <laughs> which was awesome. But the first thing that happens, I uh, said, you have anything physically that gives you any trouble? And he's like, yeah, my thumb, and I hurt my thumb really bad. And, and, and he always hurts, and skateboarding always hurts. Great, and he goes, are you kidding me? And his thumb gets me. It was awesome, because God's touching his heart. It's powerful. And this other kid, I said, man, I said, you, you've got this Art, like he loved to draw see you and drawing and just started to prophesy some stuff and words of knowledge about him. He started to grow up the heart about his mom. And the kid's like, yeah, he is not, I'm going to be an architect. And he's bringing his life back into the picture. Well, I, I, I keep talking to him and find out that both of them are from, I think they're from Sweden. I'm pretty sure that's where they're from. Both of them had girlfriends. Both of them broke up with their girlfriends. Their girlfriends broke up with them. Both of them came to Las Vegas for two more weeks of partying because they have a gun in their, in their life. Oh. One of them's going to do it, the next one's going to do it. And both those kids are there for a last hoorah, a last party. And life has become limited to something so nothing. For they ruined our life, these girls ruined our life, we don't want to live anymore. And I lived that way my whole life. Suicidal, just didn't want to live anymore. Constant, man, because I could never fix me. Well, that's the key. You can't fix you. You submit to God. We don't come to God because you need you need to be clean when you come in. You come in and God cleans you. Come on, it's amazing. So this kid's going to commit suicide. This kid, he starts to say, man, I can't believe this. He goes, I, I didn't. He goes, I, I didn't think that, that God would find me in such a place filled with this bad things. Look around you. It's like, look around this place. God found me here. Wow, and they both didn't want to die. Now they had a reason to live. 
What we fail to realize is that the person in front of you could be that person. And people don't want to live anymore because they have no value in their life anymore because they're devalued. You know, this thing on the earth of rejection that we think that we have to have the spirit of rejection is the devil. Come on. I don't even go after rejection. Because what? The devil's the only one rejected. He's the only one hopeless. He's the only one that has the right to be bitter, angry, in unforgiveness. There's no reason for him to live. He's no hope. There's no hope for him ever. So for me to talk to somebody that feels rejected, feeling rejected is something that is normal. Believing that you've been accepted is something that is abnormal. The way that seems right to a man has brought itself into the church and we have lived by our feelings instead of faith in Jesus Christ. And we can't afford to live by feelings anymore. If you live by them, live by them. Before we come into the kingdom, we only did what we felt like doing. But once you come in, you do it and you live by faith. It's not about what you feel like. If you have to live, why don't you feel like he loves me? People come up to me and say, Todd, pray for me and I just feel the love of God. I say, absolutely not. That's crazy. That's twisted. I would be hurting you if I did that. If I would pray for you to feel the love of God, then you would never know the love of God. That's right. You would always need someone else to pray for you so you can have a good, use bumpy feeling. It's not about feelings. It's about faith. Are you with me? Is this really important? How can I function outside of the church if I need you to pray for me when I come to church so that I feel the love of God? I have to know His love. His love is unending. His love is never ceasing. It never stops. His gaze is constantly on me. He never looks away. He always is looking dead set right on me. And He's looking dead set on you and you and you and you. And He never changes. And He's always dead set on us. It's hard to believe because we're thinking, well, it's just God. Yeah, but God's like huge. And God wants to fill us with His fullness. Come on, and that God lives inside of you. That's crazy. If God lives inside of you and He wants to fill you with His fullness and His love is never ending, then why would I think less than that? Because I need my mind renewed so that I can start to think like God thinks. There's a way that seems right to a man, and we live by it, we're governed by it, and it crushes us. Are you with me? It's not okay. See, in the first service I started out by saying, it's not okay. See, I love praying for the sick. I love seeing the sick. You know, I love, I love seeing that stuff. I love prophesying. I love that stuff. But what I love the most is that I'm a son and nobody can ever take that away. <laughs> I love praying for the sick. Praying for healing the sick and prophesying is a benefit. It's a side benefit of being a son. So being a son entitles me to everything that the Father has. And the Father is full of joy, He's full of peace, He's full of awesome stuff, man. And that's mine. But I've got to start to think like He thinks, or I'll live from here towards here instead of from there towards here. So I've got to change the way I, I think. I've got to set my mind on things above. I've got to realize that I'm seated. I pray from victory, not towards it. Are you with me? Is this too much? Are you okay? Yeah? Good? <laughs> Let me give you another uh, play in this movie. And then, uh, uh, yeah, because I'm going to be, I love talking about it because I'm going to be on one soon. And I get to touch all kinds of people, and it's just awesome. I get to watch people sit in the seats and cry. They were angry at God, they were bitter, they had nothing to do with me. <laughs> Put up their little wall. They can't get out because I love them. <laughs> it's awesome. People that are the angriest to you, if you allow them to be, they'll perfect love in you the deepest. <laughs> the people that are the meanest to you, perfect love in you the most. It's easy to love those that love you, but it's really, 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 really love is loving people that can't do anything or love you back at all. You just give it to them. Why? Because it's not something they had to do anything to earn. You give it to them freely. By grace, you give it away. Mercy. We live in mercy. We live in forgiveness. I don't live towards it, I live from it. I don't live towards mercy so that one day I'm going to get mercy if I show mercy here. That's, if I do this, you'll give me this. That's twisted. I have become it. Come on. I don't show forgiveness so that one day I'm forgiven. I show forgiveness because I am forgiven. I live in forgiveness. Why would I hold something against somebody they didn't know what they were doing when they did it? Come on, the reality of this thing is if somebody knew who they were and knew what they were doing, they never would have did what they did. 
So why couldn't you forgive that? Well, they hurt me. <clears throat> There's the problem. Me. They're me. Me. But if you don't know what they did to me, you don't know how they treated me. You don't know why my mom did this to me and my dad did this to me. No. The reality of this thing is, is do you know what we did to Jesus? Did Jesus hold it against you, or did he say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Wow, that makes this easy, man. Think with me. I, I, God revealed this to me. It was awesome. I was in a situation where I was having aggressive. It wasn't just from one person. It was from almost everybody. Constant. And it never, like, squeezed me. It, it, it grew me. It sharpened me. It just made me sharper and wiser. And I'd always... Pray. I never pray against people. God, show them and get them gone because they're our. I just go, oh, thank you. Father, I thank you. They, they don't know what they're doing. God, I'd slip them up and I'd just thank you for them. God, I ask you to bless them. Why? Because in the Beatitudes, which is the attitudes of being, okay. the Sermon on the Mount, the attitudes of being, not the do attitudes, but the be attitudes, Matthew 5 through 7, yeah. you bless them. Who curse you. You pray for those who despitefully use you. So when you're despitefully used, you pray for them. You don't say, well, they shouldn't have done that. You're right, they shouldn't have. Now, who are you to hold them against them? Because you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Think with me. That's so simple, right? Well, they shouldn't have done that. Well, look at what you're saying right now. What do you mean they shouldn't have done that? I understand. Should you be holding against them? Well, no, but look what they did. Then all of a sudden we're caught in this thing. He did, they did this, and I did this, and we're a liar. Oh God, you stand for God. They shouldn't have done that to me. God, was, they did this to me, and then they did this to me, and then you're going to stand for God. You're going to go, me, go oh God, it was me. <laughs> Think with me, seriously. Are you with me? I want you to picture this. People think that they're going to get before God, and they're going to give God a piece of their mind. <laughs> It's not going to work out well for you. <laughs> well, well, I've got some questions to ask him. To be on your face in a puddle of mess going, holy, 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 holy. <laughs> but the reality of this thing is, if you were to break the gun, questions about this, you will find out that it's all about selfishness. And when selfishness leaves and selflessness enters, all of a sudden, you don't have so many problems. The Bible doesn't say, deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It says, deny your self. See, the Beatitudes are the attitudes of being, not the attitudes of doing. You cannot do them in your strength. You have to. You have to do them out of the place of being that comes from this strength. But you first have to submit yourself to that. See, it's not submit, submit to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee. It's submit to God, and out of your submission to God, the devil's resist. Amen. It's not a two-step process. It's a one-step. The one step is submission. Submission doesn't mean part of you. Submission means every part of you is submitted to him. Are you with me still? I know. It's making any sense at all. So, all these... All these things were all, when I you know, first came into the kingdom and gosh, I always talked about my, my wife. Mm-hmm. She was she was the hardest one. <coughs> right there. Yeah. She was. She didn't see what I saw. That's great. People and she aggressively attacked me. Not beat me up. She was very I put us into lots of uncomfortable situations. All the time. <laughs> all the time. To the place where for the first nine months of our lives she wouldn't even go public with me. My daughter would go. She said, I will, I will not go anywhere with you. You are embarrassed with me. <coughs> That's not being mean or putting guilt on. I'm just sharing that testimony because it's produced so much fruit in other people's lives, realizing that we can do this. It doesn't matter who's against you, it matters that God is for you. But it doesn't make me a man of God by confessing. To my life, I'm a man of God. You see what I'm doing right now, I'm a man of God. You're wrong and I'm right. That doesn't make me a man of God. And I never did that. I told her she's wrong. I always went to my bedroom and I would cry and I would thank God that the tree that I am is going to bear the fruit. Because I don't need to tell them what kind of tree I am. Cherry trees don't go to the cherry tree, they just bear cherry. Because that's what kind of tree they are. 
So the proof that I have that bears witness of whether I'm a man of God or not. Those tears are real. We both cry a lot. Because God's amazing and He's good. And I always say to her, aren't you glad that I didn't back off? <laughs> because it was horrible. Not just from her, from her mama, from everybody, because I hurt everything. See, I was a drug addict for 22 years. I was, a, I was an angry manipulator, a maneuver of people. For nine years that she knew me, I stole from everyone on my side and her side. And she was my girlfriend, and she was not a believer. She was an atheist. I was an aggressive one. I was angry, and I was a drug addict. You know? And I had a daughter for those nine years. A year and a half into our relationship, we had a daughter who was sitting right there. And all she knew was that daddy can't hold a job. Daddy's a liar. Daddy's a thief. He steals from everybody. Daddy's a drug addict. He promises me every day that will never happen again. And people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, she's going to do this. No, she needs Jesus. She needs Jesus. My daughter's 15 and she has zero memory of any of that stuff. It's not even in her memory. It's gone. God didn't, it's, he wiped it out. Like it's really gone. Like it's not like, well, she's going to have, she's just suppressing it. Stop your psychological stuff. <laughs> she's really, it's really not there. It's awesome. We, sometimes we, that's part of that elevating the process above the acceptance thing that I said before. Sometimes we're so going after the process of fixing somebody and never believe that there can be an end suddenly where it's really fixed. First of all, even in the process, it's not you that fixes it. Sometimes we've been so conscious of the process that you created, not you, but we have created, created a program that keeps people dependent upon us in order to stay free. And that's codependency and that's sin. Good say what you want or think what you want, it doesn't matter. If you need me to not say that so you can have a ministry, you ought to not have it. Because if I need you to be dependent upon me to get me free, to get you free, I've done the wrong thing. I've done an injustice to the gospel. But if I can lead you to a mentor from the Holy Spirit and to a father named God, and have you have that for a personal relationship between you and your father, because the Bible says, call no one on earth your father, for you have one father. And then Holy Spirit being your mentor, your accountability partner that never leaves. You cannot have a person be your accountability partner because that accountability partner sometimes will be around you. You have to have a relationship with Holy Spirit so that He can keep you free. Come on, man. Am I making any sense? Sometimes I preach that way now that I'm looking at you. And, and this is really powerful because He's the only one that can keep us free. Yeah. Holy Spirit's the only one. He'll never leave us. He'll never turn us back. He's always there. And He discloses the next of His name. And, and as I'm going and as I'm traveling places, I see more of a need for mentors, more of a need, the request need. I need a mentor. People email me, Todd, will you be my mentor? Todd, I need this, I need that, I need you to be my mentor. And, and my response is, Holy Spirit can only be the mentor in your life. Can be the mentor that will never leave you. I, I am all about leaning for people and growing and having people pour into my life, but I'm never about dependency. See, Dan is a person that's been in my life. We're the only ones in that ministry. But Dan is not a person that I need him to keep me accountable. When I'm in a hotel room and I'm by myself, I'm not by myself. Are you with me? When I'm, when I'm at home and, and nobody's there, there's always somebody there. <laughs> when I'm on a plane and I'm traveling and I'm gone for, I'm going away right now for 15 days, man. I'm going to. Australia for two weeks, okay? And who's with me? Holy Spirit's with me. Always. He never leaves. He's always there. And it's exciting. It's powerful. It's not like, oh my gosh, I'm going to... No, He's there. So it's important that we have this relationship. Because if my, if my heart doesn't produce the... If my life doesn't produce the need for you to press into a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, then I've done an injustice to the gospel. Are you with me? Okay. See if that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share another testimony from a plane and I want to take it somewhere. 
Jesus, we love you. Father, thank you for grace, God. Thank you that you would make something out of this, God. That we would walk away transformed, God. That we would walk away with a different mindset, God. Let's thank you for grace, the reality of what Jesus really is. And who we really are. Because of what he did. So I, I, I come on the plane and, and I go, I'm sitting um, in the middle somewhere, and I, I sit down, and I, when, I, when I do this, point over there, it's because I can visually see the testimony again, so it gives me a, like a photographic memory of the testimony, like a video of who played out. So I get, on the, I get on the plane, I sit, and there's two people beside me, and there's a gentleman and a lady, and I... I said, hey, how are you guys doing? Well, we've had a bad blanket day. We're just upset, sad, angry. And I said, oh, wow. And they go, they go, how are you doing? Because I'm doing it. It's really nice to meet you. I said, bless you. And I thought, wait, yeah. They sit down. The, you know the video that comes on for the plane where it says, hi, welcome to whatever plane you're on. As soon as she goes, Jesus, blank us. Because it was too loud, so she snapped, right? So when the she just snapped, it's weird. And people were so angry about stuff. I mean, it ought not be named among people that would call themselves Christians. And I'm not being mean. I'm saying we can live in a different place. But I'm not talking about some oh, things perfect and yeah, all my ducks are in the row. That's not about. That's crazy. If my life is perfect because my ducks are in the row, that's twisted. No, it's because Jesus, he, he, he was crucified for my offenses. He was raised for my justification. So my ducks being in a row, if my ducks in a row come from the reality of redemption in its entirety, and I realize that redemption doesn't mean that I've just been purchased by blood, but redemption means that I've been brought back to the original value that God created me to be in the beginning as if I never ate the tree. If I can live from a place as if I never sinned, if I can live from a place as if I never messed up. And every day His mercies are new. And all I need to do is seek God, see His face, and live from that perspective. And then I won't be twisted in that perspective. If I can live that way every day, if I can just see what He really paid a price for. If I see that He paid a price for me to be seated with Him. If I see that He paid a price for Him to fill me. And for me to be possessed by Him. And that the only right I have is God, by mercy and grace, woke me up this morning so that I have one word in to manifest Him and not me. That I don't have the right to manifest me anymore. Come on, sometimes when we got rights, we got issues. Well, I've got the right. Well, they shouldn't have done. Well, they shouldn't have done. Well, yeah, they're going to get what they deserve. And if you want what you deserve, go to hell. Because the reality is, is that grace says no. We're not. Cost in heaven. Right? So I'm on the plane with all that in me and way more. <laughs> and they're just sad. And so I'm watching, I've got the visual Bible on my, on my iPad, the Gospel of John, and Matthew, and the Book of Acts. And I'm like, I love it. Sure, anybody ever see them? Oh my gosh, yeah, I've watched them a million times. They're awesome. Because it's the Bible, walk out. If you have trouble reading your Bible, if you have trouble connecting with the Word, then get it, at least visually or audibly, get something, get the Word in you, allow that Word to come and transform you. Amen. Right? My family has watched them well a lot. But I don't care, I'm watching them like, oh, this is so good. Oh, this is so good. And they're trying to sleep, and he gets up to go to the bathroom, and, and, and she's over the window, and I, and I hear my wife, and she's dealing with me, and I just, look, you, you got You've got chronic neck problems, and you've got a back problem. You've got three discs down below, two discs, one, one probably, probably two in your neck that give you trouble. You have problems going down, radiates down your arm. I said it goes down your leg, same side. I said it's horrible. She goes, yeah, it's really bad. I said, man. And then her boyfriend walked back in, and I said, hey, man, I was just talking to a girl in the bathroom. He looked, looks at her, why? <laughs> so I just hold it up. He goes, that's amazing. I said, yeah, man. I said, I said I, we were actually in our visa. We had like an hour and a half, like an hour and a half. We're in our visa. I said, man, I said, I, I said, I really want to pray for you. Would you be okay with that? And he's like, yeah, dude, pray for you. Anything else, man? You know, there is in the end of anything else. Right? Only Jesus is real help. The Holy Spirit's called the helper. So anything doesn't help. 
listen to me. Anything doesn't help. Let me, let me tell you, sometimes we have such a hard day that we go home and we lay on the pillow and we think that by sleeping that night it will help. We're wrong. I mean, I understand that physical rest helps, but the reality of you living in rest is what he did. You will not have rest by just hitting your pillow. You cannot take a vacation to get away. I just always thought that was weird. You don't take a vacation to get away from life. You won't, you won't bring Jesus with you. Come on, man. We get a break. Once a year, we go on vacation. And we got the seven days. We're going to go and, oh, thank God. Yeah, let's go. Let's go enjoy our vacation. It's awesome. Problem. Six days. Oh, man. We're going to go back to work soon. Oh, <laughs> Seventh day. Oh, well, let's get the back down. Like, oh, yeah. Let's <laughs> It's both. It's a reality. Come on, man. I'm not telling you to raise your hand. If you feel that, that's the reality of this. Yeah. We don't have to live that way. I've never lived that way since the kingdom. Not one day of condemnation, depression, guilt, or shame. Yeah. Ever. Since I've been saved. Not, not one. It's not mine to take. And it's not God's to give. God did not give us depression. God did not give us that stuff. Satan is depressed, and he's the only one that has the legal right to be depressed forever. He has no right to be happy because he's eternally damned. We use the words God damn together as if God damned the situation, and that's twisted. The only thing that God has damned is Satan. Oh, I didn't just cuss. <laughs> but it's true. You think about those two words together. God damned. God did not send his son to condemn the world. But he sent his son so that through Jesus, the world might be saved. It's awesome. So many people are thinking that way. Twisted up thinking that way. And these people sitting beside me are thinking that way. And I said, come on, bro, give me your hand. Pray right now. So we pray, and she's like, oh my gosh, she goes, I don't know what's going on right now. She goes, well, something's in me. She goes, oh. He lives in you. And the husband, the boyfriend's like, this is awesome. He's like, this is incredible. This is awesome. I said, man, you know, let me pray for your right shoulder, your left knee. He goes, oh my gosh. <laughs> Your job wouldn't be so hard. Your job would be easy. Why? Because you just get Jesus away. <clears throat> Everywhere you are. I'm waiting for somebody that works in customer service to give me the microphone. <laughs> 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 no, I'm serious. Uh, if you're in need of healing, come to counter so and so. So I said to myself, Moment, let me pray for you. He goes, I can't believe this. I said, man, I got on the plane. I said, so you got kind of upset about some stuff. I didn't want to trouble you. But I have to talk to you because I live my life in such a way that Jesus is in me. And he's amazing. He loves you so much. He goes, no, he goes, we can actually we can actually feel it. We can feel it. Yeah. Which is cool. It's not okay that once you're born again to live by feelings. But it's okay for people to be around you and feel the presence of God is on your life. Are you with me? I had to explain that. Because... So I said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, I don't know what you do for a living. I said, but like I saw a computer screen, just real quick, just a picture of it. And I saw the colors red and green and blue. And the red was kind of wavy and the green was kind of shaped and the blue was kind of through it all. And I told her what I saw. And he goes, this is crazy, man. I go, why? What's going on? She goes, he goes, she designs underwater, underwater systems. That's what she does. And the colors that she uses are red and green and blue. She says, this is nuts. <laughs> Christ lives in me. He's the hope of glory. And he loves you and he wants to give you hope. It's amazing. But it's not about trying to get your joy or get your hope or get your love from, from life. You have to get your love from Jesus Christ and the crucified. 
He paid more of a price than just to get you to heaven. See, check this out, guys. If we just pray a prayer to get to heaven, then we'll position ourselves inside the church waiting for Jesus to come back, seeing how bad the world is. We will look at life through an eschatology eye, and we will see Jesus is coming soon, and our conversation will be all about the Lord's return. Which is not bad that he returns, but, I, but I'm having fun right now. Yeah. <laughs> Let me explain that. God could have stopped the devil in a second. He didn't have to put him here. But God put him here for a reason. He put him here for a reason so that he could create man in his image, and the devil would get stomped on by his creation. So if it was all about me getting to heaven, I would pray for Jesus to return to get me out of here because I can't handle it anymore. And what I'm saying is, my job is hard, my people are mean, my family is just resistant, everybody's in rebellion, people are loving themselves. Oh my gosh, God, today I read in Timothy that all this stuff is the stuff at the end. It's the last days, God, we're the last days. Jesus, help, get me out of here to heaven with me and to hell with everybody else. So when you position yourself for Jesus' return and you pray for him to come back, you're saying, get me out of here. I can't handle it anymore. It's about me, not them. Take me now. Get me out now. It's hard enough. Get me out, though. And that's not okay. Because God left us here to stop hell for a living. And he gets good pleasure out of watching his kid believe who their daddy is. He gets good pleasure out of watching his kids out of infancy destroy the works of the devil. The mission statement of a Christian is not to get to heaven. The mission statement of the Christian is first John 3. For this reason, Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. So the mission statement of us is to destroy hell for a living. Amen? Okay. Let me take you over here real quick. Something? Okay. All right. Are you guys all right? Yeah. I just, I just want to hit something... Real quick, Matthew 16. Actually, I think it's... Yeah, let's go back. Satan, 
You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And it doesn't stop there, because Jesus says this. He says, then Jesus said, so exactly, as soon as he said this, because it's kind of broken up in our Bibles, unless we had the, the letter that's read straight through, right? Because Jesus is a teacher, he's going into something, and I don't believe he's talking about the gates of hell to his church. Head stone. That says, I'll build my church on this rock, and the gate of hell will not go against it. And I've heard it preached this way, but I want to give you a revelation, I believe, that I believe is from heaven. To take it for what you want. Because Jesus says, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it's destruction. So thinking like a man is destructive. You with me? You can't just say, I'm only human anymore. You have to know that you're a man or woman of God. It's not okay to say, hey, I'm only human. It's all. Don't use that excuse. Be very careful with that. Because you will nurture a carnal nature. Okay. So Jesus says, right after he says, Get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And Jesus says, If anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Last time, when I was in the last service, I talked about First Peter, and I talked about the salvation, receiving the ending of your faith, that is the salvation of your soul. So I talked in the beginning, and I talked about Thessalonians, where, where it says that, may the God of peace sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. So your spirit is being born again and be united to God's spirit, one spirit with Him. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions and your thinking, your thought process, because we are to be renewed in our mind. Our souls need to be fixed. We can't afford to head to heaven thinking like hell until we get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are you with me? It's not okay to be headed somewhere thinking like hell until we get there. There's a way that seems right to him, and it is destructive, and it destroys us. So Jesus is talking here. He's like, who do you say I am? Peter, Peter's like, you're the Christ. Jesus is like, whoa, awesome. You just heard from Dad. Yeah. Right? He's like, and this is a rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against you. Right? So... And he's like, and you know, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven wherever you bow you bow in heaven wherever you loose us, you loose in heaven. And then Peter's like, Jesus is like, by the way, and I'm going to be killed and delivered up. Peter's like, no! <laughs> that didn't sound like God. Since God sent his son to save the world. But Peter said, nothing shall ever happen to you. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan! That had to like not feel good. But what did he say? Get behind me, Satan. For you have in mind, you're not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of the things of man. Watch this. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be built against it. It's my belief system. That Jesus is talking about denying yourself. What happened, Peter? Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to you. Ever. Jesus just said, I'm going to die. He said, No! The best thing ever happened to me! You're not leaving! No way! I'll die for you! And he believed it because he's the only one that had a sword. Right? Come on! So he says, No! And Jesus rebukes him and says, Get behind me, Satan! You're thinking like a man! So to say I'm only human is to say I'm only demonic. <laughs> Think with me. He says, upon this rock, what's the rock? Christ. Jesus. What happened? Why did, why did Peter, who just heard from God, get called the devil? Because there's a way that seems right to a man. And in the end, it's destruction. So what he said was that when you think like that, you're thinking like the devil, because the gate of hell is not chasing the church. Who is the church? A building or us? So where could the gate of hell be? The only gate of hell that I believe is any thought that's not renewed by God, because I believe the gate of hell he's talking about is between our ears. Come on, because he said, unless a man denies himself, pick something across, follow me. 
to never be my disciple. Think with me, man. The devil is after this right here. And Jesus goes right into it and he goes, you know what? Unless a man denies himself. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, mind, will, emotions, and his head is calm? What would it profit you to go to church and praise God and to just and, and but to not submit your soul to God, to not, to not submit your mind, to not have your mind renewed. What would it be like to go through life and just praise God and then go through hell of circumstance and look just like your circumstance? Come on, man. I'm speaking to you. See, because I believe this is huge. I want to I finish with this. And I'm going to read this one scripture. And then pray. You guys got to let me go. Please. Because <laughs> i got to fly so far and it drives two and a half hours to get to where I can fly. <laughs> Proverbs 3. Dude, you are playing D ball. <laughs> playing basketball? Are you? Okay. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> You're down in the water, and it's like, it's, it matches, and it's like this. Can I share it? Yeah. It's so good. Just a little bit of it. When, you know, it's with a woman, you know that, like, when a woman delivers a baby, the first thing that happens is the water breaks. That's how you get babies coming. And when the person gets baptized, it's like going down into the womb of God. And when they come out of the water, it's like the water breaks. And the Holy Spirit says, Look up, my dear baby. Look up. <laughs> well, what he said, I'm like, oh, make you wait for your mom. That's a hard one there, man. So I'm like, you need to all you call your parents right now. Leave messages, whatever. You just get a hold of them. And you call them first. You, and all the parents and grandparents, everybody showed up at 1.30 in the morning. Man. And, and like a hundred, I think it was like a hundred. I don't know, but it was awesome. Little nine-year-old kids coming out of the water. <laughs> oh, God. Look at this. Let me read this. When I came out of King Charles, I came home. By the way, it took a year for my wife to come around to where she saw the fruit on my tree and said, I will never stand against God. This is awesome. So that lady I told you bought me. And all my family and my family on page. And most yeah. of them were in the kingdom. Be careful because sometimes when you don't see the response of people, you'll think that they're not giving it. Never forget that you're a sower or a waterer, and you're not the one that brings into the Some sow, some water, God brings When I came out of King Challenge, my mom, for Christmas, when I got out in October, and for Christmas, my mom gave me, uh, now this is in the beginning. She, she found a little card at the Christian bookstore, and on the little card, it said, Todd on top of it. So many, and has Proverbs 3 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So good. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord in your heart of evil. He'll be health in your flesh and strength in your bones. 